can record. And this time, I, when I was preparing the slides for this meeting, I actually added a slide so I would remember this time uh, to make sure everything is okay. Uh, so just a second. So guys, uh, we have a lot to cover today. So I'll try. My idea is that we do something very similar to last time. That we we go over we briefly go over some summary of what we did last week. Uh, actually, uh, I'm planning on redoing last week's meeting with a, a bunch of friends who couldn't join. So we'd actually get the material recorded anyway. So there will be an extra meeting I'll do at some point, I don't know when, just to discuss the whole mini world systems again, uh, so that at least we have that material recorded and we can put it up on the website. Uh, anyway, so the idea is to give a very short summary, uh, to go over the many questions that we had that were sent over, uh, then to go into directly into the, the four chapters that we have to discuss today. My idea, again, is that you interrupt and we, we talk as we go along. Uh, but uh, since we're, we're committed to giving a very kind of coarse grained overview, not very detailed overview of things, I think that it's, it's more useful to kind of give big stroke, big broad strokes over the material and to focus on the logic behind the steps rather than on the fine details of every movement that he proposes. So for example, I didn't systematize the examples of Greece, Rome, different religions, different forms of, of different types of prophet, pro, prophets and things like this. So you'll see that it's a kind of zoom out view, but it actually corresponds a bit to the material in that sense, because it also is a zooming out of some, some sort, right? So to begin with, just uh, these, I think, are the three kind of main things we saw last time, right? Uh, the first one here is this thing here is pretty much Karatani's structure for his argument of how is it that we got to, to settlements and what the relation between what he calls this reciprocity based mode, mode A, uh, and mode B, the state. What's actually the relation? What does it mean to say, you know, society against the state? What is that against? And what's the actual logic behind this thing? So his proposal, the two polemic proposals that he, he presented to us in the first, in the, in that first big chapter, first is that the move from nomadic bands to settle so what he calls the se sedentary revolution. It's actually a, a, an effect of climate change. And he has that one reference from that Japanese guy who talks about uh, the effects on hunting from the, the, the ice age and, and how actually you should look at settling and, this, and sedentary uh, establishment as a sort of problematic thing not something people would opt into just for the sake of it because it creates a bunch of problems, right? So the, the good thing about presenting it in this sort of contingent response to a problem, right? The, the sedentary revolution is that it explains why certain things that existed in the nomadic relations remained in the, in the settled uh, uh, community because it wasn't something people abandoned on purpose. So even though it lost, let's say, its material base, it would remain because that's, the, let's say, our tradition, right? This is how he explains why is it that we didn't take this route, since settlement already brings out all the necessary conditions for the rise in inequality, the relation between domination between different communities. Why didn't this establish itself? Why didn't inequality and coercion lead to the state? And his, his account is that, well, when we, since we, we didn't settle on purpose, but out of necessity due to, to contingent climate change, uh, our ways of life kind of block this virtual possibility of the state, right? 
so it leads to clan society rather than to state society. And only through an external sort of war, we will go into this in detail today, then does the state actually actualize itself, right? Uh, the second thing we saw going into the structure of reciprocity was a sort of, but we saw all the different relations, right? Like generalized reciprocity, balanced reciprocity, and negative reciprocity. And we know that pooling or generalized reciprocity happens within the household. Between households, we have this balanced reciprocity. And between settlements, we have what he calls negative reciprocity, right? Negative reciprocity can be both uh, rituals like the potluck or things that involve gift exchange, but can also be, let's say, negative in the sense of destruction of things like war, for example. Uh, and I tried something slightly crazy, but that I will be ex exploring, further exploring today, which is this little ruler here, or this little thing. What is this thing here? I tried to map reciprocity to the number of spaces that it creates, right? So what we call pooling or generalized reciprocity doesn't create any space, right? It's inside the family. So it just preserves what was already there. Balanced reciprocity connects these two things to, to zero spaces as if they were one. It's a settlement. And negative reciprocity, it connects two ones, two unities, but it keeps them disjunct. It doesn't make them into one thing. Right? So I try to explore if we can, let's say, further connect the different qualities of reciprocity with a certain spatial quality of them, right? So to show that reciprocity kind of changes in its quality, depending on the number of spaces that it stitches together or that it constructs or it connects. And this is important because we'll see that we can, in a very weird way, as I will propose today, explain the structure of the law out of this in the same kind of spatial structure. And I think that more than just a metaphor, I think this is very kind of intrinsic to Karatani's method. He doesn't treat exchange as there being a space and then there is someone here and someone here and they exchange stuff. He treats it in such a way that exchanging stuff creates these spaces, defines where borders are, where borders will be suspended and things like this. So uh, it, it is not the case that we have a logical analysis of the form of exchange and a spatial analysis of how it's distributed on, in space. These two things are internally connected so that if you expand spatially, you change logically. These things are intrinsically connected. They're not externally related, right? So, why is this important? Because this gives us a way of approaching what he's doing as a sort of the logical construction of social spaces, right? So it is a sort of logics of social worlds. What it means for certain things to be connected, how does this kind of create a certain horizon of a world, right? Uh, so for example, in this case here, we know that you have generalized reciprocity, balanced reciprocity, negative reciprocity, and it can also function as negative reciprocity with other settlements outside of a federation, for example, or even from here outside, right? And we know that this, is, this makes for the border of this world very fragile, because depending on what comes from the outside, it might be overturned, right? Excuse, excuse me, I have a, a question. Sure. Um, I was wondering because you mentioned that um, there's a kind of like a spatial mapping here, but there's also a kind of set theory way of understanding what he's doing. And then you also have, you also have um, kind of, diff you have several different ways of figuring what Karatani is doing here, but they're kind of different ways of doing it. And I was wondering whether you've encountered any difficulties in terms of your diagrams? Like, is, is it set theory that allows us best to understand what he's talking about? Or is it a kind of spatial mapping of a community or a kind of 
almost like a number line system. I was just wondering because um, what he's talking about seems to almost resist um, diagrams sometimes. Yeah, um, look, I don't think that these are equivalent things. I'm just, this is just a let's say, graphical dis description of the argument, right? This comes after, before this, that comes before sure. this, and so on. It's just very kind of visual, just of help. This thing here, it has a bit more structure. Uh, this is not, not, nothing here is like set theory based exactly. I'm just trying to, I, I didn't really explain this yet, but it's something else. This here is actually something I'm proposing, and it's actually a sort of algebraic topology kind of approach, if you want to get to it. It's because I'm currently also discussing uh, Badiou's logics of worlds, where this sort of correlations between spaces and logic is very important uh, in, in a, something called topos theory. And uh, so there are some musings here, which I'm taking from somewhere else. Uh, and I putting them to the test, but I don't know how to answer your question. Of course, I have hard time with diagrams, but I wonder if it's it's probably me, <laughs> not the diagrams. To be, I think I think it's the Karatani himself. I think. Yeah, I think I think what he does. I mean, I'm, I hope to show to you guys that it's very formalizable what he's proposing. I don't think it resists formalization in any serious sense. But uh, just so we can move on, and I think it will find. I have one with what question. Uh, one question. Why does uh, balanced reciprocity only create one space, whereas negative creates two? Because there's still the same number of uh, communities involved with balanced as there is with a, a negative. So, like, what's unified? How does that one come about? Well, it's, uh, first of all, he calls this, I mean, this is a settlement, a tribe, one community, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is no reciprocity here. You don't need to return, it's pooling. So the first time that you have an actual relation between parts, right? It's with the balanced reciprocity. So balanced reciprocity is not two external communities. No, it's, it's, it's within the community. I got it, okay, got it. That's what I was gonna Yeah, it's about. a very definition of within. Within, got it, got it. Okay, right? very good. And this is without. Okay, I was assuming that two communities can forge a singular. No, but I not true. Not true. Negative reciprocity. Understood. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and this here is just. I mean, this is the third thing we discussed. Karatani shows in a, the last chapter discussing magic and animism and so on that reciprocity has the structure where when I give to you something, I ask two things happen. First is that I give you the use but I don't give you the possession. So the possession is mine, even though you have the right to use it, right? But not only this, but I, everything you relate in terms of reciprocity, you relate in terms of a relation of I and thou. Why? Because the, the other to you, to whom you give, be it a thing, a person, a river, a god, doesn't matter. It needs to have the form of somebody who can give back. So this, the idea that you could shift the perspective and that this I could be here is necessary for the inverse to be possible as well, right? So uh, even though there, is, I mean, it goes into one of the questions that th there is, let's say, this, the way that this space is constructed through reciprocity. So the, when, when you give something in this reciprocity sense, it's not that you are, a I, and this thing here is an it, right? It's rather a thou, which implies that then it can itself be an I, and you are a thou. So this is implied in the very form of exchange, right? So through, through the exchange of possessions and through the, the, the displacement of the rights of use, you're also displacing the form of a perspective which can see you back, right? And there's a, a lot of interesting things that can follow from this. And, it, and Karatani just makes a, comp, a distinction between this structure and the, the stru structure of the I, it. So for example, where in, in, in a, with alienatable property, where I give something to you and you have both the use and the property of it, like with commodity exchange, right? Uh, you need to give me something totally separate, 
which I'll have the use and, and property rights over it. Uh, but these are two separate things. So he just, it's just important to remember that he makes this crucial distinction between this sort of connective structure where the same movement which, through which I send something to you is also a movement that makes it so that you are in position to see me back, right? Whereas there is a sort of separative structure in the I-if relation because the very fact that, for example, you buy something from me makes the thing you bought an it so that it actually disconnects you from me. There's nothing left of you in me when you buy something from me, right? You get all the rights with it. Nothing is left with me. So the, here is interesting because you see that it's like a stitching, right? And in this case, no, it's at, everything falls here. And then there's a different exchange where everything falls here. Anyway, we'll get into, uh, into this in a lot more detail as we go along, but it's just because I think it kind of summarizes the three points we saw last time, right? The argument concerning the sedentary revolution, the idea of different kind of modes of reciprocity, right? Depending on the spatial distinctions that they, they organize. So within households, within settlements, between settlements. Uh, and finally, how animism and magic they are, let's say, the, the expression of this same logic to relations with nature and everything, really. I think this will be important as we go along because Karatani actually, uh, what he calls a mode of exchange is not, a, it has no necessity of being between people, right? It, it's really, a society that is dominated by a mode of exchange is dominated by a mode of exchange that applies between people, between people in nature, between nature in itself. Uh, so these are all the questions that we saw. I'm going to go very quickly over them. Uh, a lot of them are actually about the stuff that we're going to read today. So rather than answer them now, I think we can just have them in mind as we go, right? So the first one is how does Movi affect the communitarian relations of friend and enemy, like in Carl Schmitt's sense? Because Karatani says that Modi kind of removes or dissolves communitarian links, right? So he gives an example of universal religions as something that has a force of unearthing somebody from a community, right? So if mode A, I think it's a good question because if in a certain sense mode D is the return of mode A, uh, which is one of the ways that Karatani describes it, uh, how is it that this thing dis dis disappears under mode D? So just one of the stuff. So second question, what does Karatani mean when he says that religions become universal through an incessant awareness of the contradiction between universality and particularity? I will get to this later on, but I think a very easy example of this is the necessity to create an image, let's say a, a name for a god, but if you create an image, so if you create a particular symbol for it, that's blasphemy in many religions. So it's constantly this problem of to bring the universal down to particular people, but at the same time not submit it to the particular, right? Uh, I think this kind of addresses question three, is Modi a critique of fetishism and idolatry or its promotion? Uh, so Karatani will play with, in, in, will kind of unfold in, in this chapter, in this chapters we're reading today, the distinction between Modi as something that questions the state and an empire and Modi as something which helps an empire's stability, right? So is it in a way a critique of the very structure of, of empires uh, and kings and so on, or is it actually a, a how does it play into the promotion of idolatry and so on? Uh, then question is very simple. What would be the weakening of mode C if social change happens in between systems, as we, we will see many times today? Uh, what would an in-between in the mode C be like? Uh, especially because, as the, the next question asks, uh, where there are, there are no sub-margins in a capitalist system, exactly. There's nothing that is, let's say, in the sort of privilege point that Karatani calls a sub-margin of an empire. So how are we to we occupy an in-between if there doesn't really seem to be an in-between in that sense? Uh, then a question about, does Karatani rely on the idea that the people that are grouped 
in a community through mode A are a homogeneous group. Uh, and I, I have the impression that no, he doesn't require this conception. Uh, nomadic people are, which is for him, let's say, the interior mode or interior kind of proto-social formation. It's a, absolutely very heterogeneous, both in where it is, the people, the ties, nothing is very stable. So it doesn't seem to rely on, on homogeneity. Uh, is mode B a new form of community? And I think that uh, we could characterize it like that, but it will see that, it, that we have good reasons not to call it a community, I think. Uh, this question here, why are there four modes, A, B, and C, A, B, C, D, and not five, right? Why is nomadic societies or this sort of pre-mode A made to, to be equivalent or to return as mode B? Uh, we already discussed this last time. And I think we'll go over it again many times, so I'll just leave it. It's a big question, I think, for us, especially for the last chapters. Uh, question nine. Is Caratani's interpretation of mode A compatible with Viveiro de Castro? Uh, I tried to show last time, though we didn't have time to go into it. I was planning to do it, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it in this kind of additional session on mini world systems. That yes, I find it absolutely compatible. Uh, it's it's definitely not as detailed as sophisticated. It's very kind of blunt, right? But uh, I don't see any contradiction, so it's compatible, even if it's not as sophisticated as I would say. Uh, question 10, again, examples of warrior farmers. I'll just leave it because we're going to see this again uh, in, a, in, a few, in a few moments. Uh, is there a psychoanalytic reading of modes of exchange? I don't know. Is there? <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, I, I guess when somebody can, could propose one, but uh, let's see. Uh, again, I'll leave this side alone. I'm not even sure how to answer it. Uh, and this, I think, is very important, which is the relationship of immanence and transcendence. And how does it play into all of this? Because it seems kind of a speculative thing coming into the social formation study. So where does the business about transcendence come into it? And how does it relate to everything? I think this will be one of the main topics we'll get into as we go. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going very quickly over these things, but we're, we're going to return to practically all these questions as we move along. It will be very helpful for us to have them in mind so we know where to stop and discuss in more detail. Uh, so, uh, Karatani begins the kind of preamble on world empires by talking about his critique of the Neolithic revolution dogma, right? Which is the thing that we just talked about now, the idea that we settle uh, because of technical developments and like it became better to be sedentary. Uh, and that was the revolution. Uh, it was, let's say, on, on a technical level. And he begins with this to actually make an argument that will, will return throughout this chapter. It kind of gets lost in the next session on, on world economies and it wasn't fully developed in the previous chapter on mini world systems, which is that uh, uh, let me see if I have a quote here. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, the, the, the main thing is that the, the technology for managing people precedes the technology for managing nature. And the argument that he gives for this, he takes from, from Capital, where Marx does something very interesting, uh, the way that he presents what he calls systems of machines. Right, the the uh, the the passage from manufacture to 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 industrial uh, and and factory structures, and you see that the, the actual passage goes. It's within the chapters on on relative surplus value, and you actually get a passage that goes from uh, cooperation through manufacture and within manufacture you kind of use the structure of cooperation uh uh in kind of uh, i don't know how you call this in english like work uh, spaces to decompose the worker and decompose the relation between parts of a work so you you have a sort of machine-like structure in the relation between laborers and only after you have this you introduce the machine system. 
So it's not that the machine system comes first, and this leads to a mechanization of laborers for Marx. It's actually the very organization of labor, which is machine-like, and this eases the introduction of machines in complex machinery into the workspace. So this is actually an argument that we will see twice in the meeting today. Uh, this idea that, and I find it a very profound and crazy idea that, uh, that material things are a metaphor for abstract things. We're used to the idea that you have something concrete and then you make like a metaphor, like, or, or you make representation of it, which is abstract, right? So you have a tree and you represent the tree. But in capital, many of the crucial passages are the inverse. You have something abstract in the sense that it only exists as relations between people. And then you get something concrete that embodies those relations. So people can have machine-like relations where their unqualified laborers divided in a sort of atomized part, doing only partial activities, never really completing an action. And then the machine system is introduced and it kind of gives, it embodies this, objectifies something that was already at play beforehand. And in a certain sense, We'll see this also with value and how equivalent, how the universal equivalent finds its embodiment in particular precious uh, uh, materials like gold and things like this. They concretely mimic something which existed abstractly before. So it's a very weird idea where you look for something concrete because its concrete properties look like the abstract properties of something. Its sensible properties look like the abstract relations you're interested in. So value was already undecomposable, uh, homogeneous in space, impervious to time. And then you look for stuff in the world that kind of imitates those abstract qualities. So gold is very good because of that. Salt is good because of that. Things like this. So in this case, again, so first you create a new kind of laborer, right? Capable of enduring the division and combination of labor. It's only at this point that you get the introduction of machinery uh, or systems of machinery into production. And he makes a similar argument with the Neolithic revolution. Like, no, people wouldn't, like, they wouldn't bring up new tools in this way if the relations between, if the relations that, let's say, made those tools intelligible weren't already there in a certain sense. So, uh, the techno for him, the, the true crucial part is the technologies of organization. They precede, let's say, the technologies of changing nature in a certain sense. Uh, and this will be an important argument that relations of production precedes the means of production. Right? The means of production kind of are attempts at objectifying the proper way of expressing those relations, but they can exist before. And uh, a second point, which is very crucial for him, is that the relationship between technology and nature, the relationship between uh, people and gods, all of this falls, I mean, he doesn't make a qualitative distinction between these sorts of relations. So if you have a re reciprocal relation between people, it can be expanded to reciprocal relations with nature, reciprocal relations between technology and nature, so a technology that is based on reciprocity, like magic things like this. So to talk about modes of exchange is not to talk, it's not a humanist concept. It's kind of indifferent to the things that, it's, that enter into the exchange, right? They can include gods, things, people, animals, inorganic life, and so on. Uh, it, this is kind of weird because we think like we are above this sort of generalization of a worldview based on a sort of essential form of, of relation, but for him, this, this is valid for capital as well. And, sorry, and this seems to relate to also the, what we we're talking, what you mentioned earlier, about this previous mode of exchange that precedes A, and that is only abstract or something, right? In some, yeah. in some, it's not settled into any concrete formation. Or something. This could be a way to read it. Yeah, I think it's a good, I mean, Karatani gives us a bunch of different kind of uh, uh, 
kind of modes, uh, forms in which something can persist or can return, right? For example, he will distinguish between the return of the repressed and the recuperation. So there are many ways that something in the past can refer back to the present. But uh, I agree with you, there's something to that. Like, it seems almost that stuff that was probably, I mean, my, my interpretation is that pull, uh, that, uh, that uh, nomadism should probably not be understood as a social formation, but as, let's say, a bunch of practices that doesn't necessarily cohere, and they only come to cohere in mode A. Like, mode A makes it seem like what preceded it was coherent, but that might be just a retroactive impression, yeah. I'm also, I'm also thinking of the um, uh, thesis on Feuerbach, with the um, emphasis on the ensemble of social relations in Marx's definition of materialism as, as taking a, like a point of cent centrality, sort of rings true in a certain sense with, with this uh, formula that you were just outlining before between abstract and concrete. Yeah, I think that there's a, 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 lot, a lot there. Uh, actually, now that you said this, I thought, I mean, we don't have enough time, but I did it anyway. So this is the classic paragraph where vulgar Marxism was born, right? This, in, in, from the preface to the contribution of critique of political economy, where he talks about people entering into relations of production appropriate to a stage in development of material forces of production, blah, 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 blah. We all kind of know this, I guess, right? But if you look at it carefully, you can see that there are actually four terms. There are two. You have relations of production, forces of production, forms of social consciousness, and property relations. He says here, they nearly express the same thing in legal terms, but well, if they express something else, they're not the same thing as that thing. So we can actually distinguish them. So I think that we could dry, draw something like this. Forces of production, relations of production, property relations, and forms of consciousness, where we can actually, I, my, my, I would venture that we could distinguish it in these terms, where human is different from nature. That's what we call forces of production. When humans are different from humans, that's what we call relations of production. When humans are like humans, that's property relations. And when humans are like nature, that's what we call force, forms of consciousness. In the sense that this is kind of a stabilized relation between us and nature. This is a sort of dynamic relation between us and nature. This is a dynamic relation between people. And this is a sort of stabilized relation between people, right? And Marx does this in a way that he kind of distinguishes, like, this is the base and this is the superstructure. So the tension between these two things determines property relations and determines forms of consciousness. So the arrows are actually simplified, right? Here you have a contradiction. Here you have an expression. And here you have like a determination almost, right? And nothing returns from one to the other, in fact. And, and we are trying, like, this would be politics for him, right? Consciousness that connects back to force, forces of production. But I think that perhaps we could even come up with this sort of double axis strategy, where we imagine this as two poles, where this sort of technological relation to nature, where you, start, you sort of try to gain power over it. So you try to produce a difference for example, from magic, but we'll see this in other, other forms as well, to a sort of harmonious relation between the two, between the whole and the part that we are, right? And in a different axis, you have, let's say, a sort of harmon harmonious interiority of human relations to a sort of hierarchical or dynamic or tense relations and level of how societies are organized, something like this. I'm not sure I'm really happy with this, but I would say that perhaps we could imagine this sort of thing here as more of Karatani's structure rather than this dual thing here. And I just wanted to show that the way that he conceives of modes, right, A, B, C, and D, they kind of reflect everywhere, right? They affect all these different things here. There will be technological forms, organizational forms, religious forms, cultural forms, all of them connected to each mode. So perhaps this would be a possible way of writing it down, I'm not sure. But I don't want to spend too much time on it because we don't have any time. So uh, he begins the chapter on, on, on the state 
talking about Jane Jacobs and saying, look, uh, really admire her for kind of defending that uh, the agricultural turn is actually conditioned by the city. So rather than defining the uh, agricultural revolution as a sort of uh, something that happens in the fields and a sort of uh, true direct uh, effect of settling, well, her, her, her thesis that, well, settling doesn't lead necessarily to the agricultural revolution, you need something more, actually is very fitting with his approach because we already saw that you don't need agriculture uh, in an agricultural revolution when you have just a settlement. Uh, and, he's, and, and he agrees with her that agricult uh, agriculture uh, didn't lead to the rise in the city. So as a sort of, first you have, you have a new sort of production and then you develop the city where people take the surplus. Actually the inverse for her is true. So you have, let's say, a bunch of communities, modes A, uh, when, when you start having this sort of domination structure, uh, as you, you create a sort of center here where commerce happens, where knowledge is exchanged. And for her, this centralization of the city is the condition for the agrarian uh, development. This is where the knowledge and the power needed to accomplish something like this would have to be before that would be possible. And then Karatani says, I basically agree with her, but she distinguishes just the sort of economic or kind of urban development of the city. She removes it from the logical development. And the only condition under which this would be possible, the sort of accumulation of power in one place, is by a break in the reciprocal relations. So it actually is not just a city. The city, the proto-city is also a proto-state. It already implies a sort of unbalanced asymmetrical relation, right? So for him, for him, for him proto-cities were also proto-states. So they were centers of trade that relies, that also are also centers of control. You couldn't have this sort of accumulation of knowledge, wealth, resources, and so on, if you didn't break that equalization of reciprocity to begin with, right? And, and he also argues something that we already saw last time, right? That this idea that I actually have it drawn here. Uh, this idea that <clears throat> we have like a settlement and another settlement. We know that we have pooling inside of households and families. You have balanced reciprocity between them. And you have negative reciprocity in this sort of federative space of settlements, tribes, communities, and so on. But then there are three options of what can happen outside of this space, at the border of this space. If you encounter some other, it, you, can, you might be able to establish amicable relations with them, or even, let's say, negative recipro reciprocity in terms of war, but leading to a sort of stabilization of this based on mode A, right? But you can also lead to two other things. The first is, a, let's say, a war where you don't get to a balancing out, a war that is not a ritual war, a war that is actually an extermination war. Or you can have a situation where you had commercial relations with a different tribe or community, meaning it was based mostly on, on commodity exchange, like silent trade or something like this, that never established a bond. So in these two cases here, where the war goes too far, so we could say like a break by excess or in this case where we have a break by lack of relation right the the commercial relations don't establish a unity or don't organize two spaces that are com combined right this negative reciprocity here is not simply that it keeps two things apart it connects it as two as two things right so in these two cases here so a break where a war goes too far or a break where there wasn't really any connection, a domination of a community on top of another is possible. So this unevenness can appear, right? Through contingency. And I was trying to think about what it would mean to, to work through this idea. And actually here it's not very well written. I'll, I'll get back to this 
later on. Let me see if I have it. Uh, but I want to show to you guys later on that we can actually arrive at the space of what happens with mode B by actually summing these this numbers together. But anyway, so you get a sort of different space when you when one community overpowers the other because you still have two communal relations two reciprocal relations but they're not the same like what is the other to me is not what's other to you it's not pers inverse perspective symmetrical perspective we get a sort of uh, kind of out of syncing with uh with the with the domination where you are, you are my other, but you are inside of me, right? So if, let's say, this community here wins and this loses, it's like, for me, they are my other, but for them, I am theirs. Like, I'm their property, or I'm their uh, servant, or I'm submitted to them. So they are more outside of me than I am outside for them. Is this colonialism? I don't think we need colonialism yet. I mean, this is this is very basic. Let's say if you have two communities and they enter non-reciprocal relation, where is the non-reciprocity coming from? What is what what is the name? How can we think asymmetry without introducing something new? Well, I came up with this little schema here, where we can see asymmetry, because imagine this overlapping here, right? Of Something that came from the outside for me, right? Isn't this the, the here is the place of negative reciprocity, right? For this community. Community A minus, the one that lost, right? But for the community that won, this outer space is not the other, it's not outside, it's not this. This outer space is where I am, it's my space. So for the community that lost, they see a outer order, an external order. For the community that won, they see, when they look at the, the community that lost, they see something that is part of them. It's something like paraconsistent logics, right? Where one logic works in the context of other logics. I, I... Yeah, and I don't, I'm not sure if, if, if you can go that far. I just want to say that, like, and I, I will actually try something more bold later on, but simply to say that when you get this unsinking, this displacement kind of of these two measures of uh, generalized reciprocity, balanced reciprocity, and negative reciprocity. So my distinction of space is not like your distinction of space. And you won and I lost. This is enough for us to have this, the asymmetry here. It's like you, are, from my perspective of the winner, you are part of me. From my perspective as a loser, you are outside of me, right? So it's not symmetric. The people who won say you are mine or you are me. And people who lost say you are another, right? So we can start talking about this kind of overlapping of spaces without having to introduce anything new, right? We just kind of deduced the asymmetry only from the interaction of recipro reciprocal spaces, right? They're kind of superimposed by violence. So talking about violence, uh, Karatani does something which I think is, is actually so simple, but actually but very kind of consequential, which is to say, look guys, this thing that we just did here, uh, it's actually this structure here, it's just like what Hobbes is talking about in the Leviathan, but Hobbes, he, he treats it as if the state ar arises from the relation between people and not the relation between communities. So he makes two points regarding Hobbes. The first is, uh, well, the pact that creates the social contract of a, or a sovereign state is not the pact between people that are at war with each other individually, but it's actually the fact between communities that are at war. So, which makes much more sense in my opinion, uh, and, and, and kind of allows us to bypass a whole metaphysics of war as the psychological state of people, like most kind of 
lovers of Hobbes tries to do sometimes with political theory. Uh, and uh, so the first point is this, that we move from individual, a description of Hobbes in terms of individuals coming up with a state to a description of the communities leading to a state. And second is that he shows that uh, there is actually, that Hobbes himself treated the creation of commonwealth, commonwealth by fear. So this sort of violent kind of structure where, let's say, this guy here can actually annihilate this guy here. And by fear, I pledge allegiance to him. He says, this is an exchange. Like this doesn't, just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's not an exchange, right? Uh, so for him, uh, there is no problem thinking about the, create, the social pact behind the Commonwealth as a, as a form of exchange. And this will become very important later on. Uh, another way that he also connects this with, uh, which I think, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very simple interpretation, but again, very important, is that he says, it, this, it, this is very important for us to understand exactly how I mean, he spends a long time talking about what it means to, for the law to appear or for a, a rule in the form of the law to appear. Uh, so how can this asymmetry between two structures, like a, com a community that lost and a community that won, which is so therefore there is an asymmetry here. How can this become a, 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 a new form of ruling that's not simply, let's say, kind of a... a uh, stability, provisory stability between forces, right? And one thing that he talks about is how uh, this sort of negative reciprocity is kind of uh, introjected or contained by, by the asymmetry. And if we return here, you can see that in a certain sense, this negative reciprocity is kind of hidden below the unitary space of the community that won, right? And he interpret. This is how he interprets the 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 law of Talion. I don't know how you call it, like eye for an eye, right? He says the the whole point of eye for an eye is that you only get one eye, right? Uh, I always love this 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 idea that people think reciprocity is a beautiful thing, but reciprocity means it's actually a spiraling structure, right? If, if I give you something, I can expect more from you and you can expect more from me and so on and so forth. And a vendetta can actually lead to an increase of violence. If you kill one person in my family, I get to kill two people in your family, you get three people in my family and this passes on from generation to generation. And uh, the idea of eye for an eye is like, it's actually a lowering of the vendetta. It's not the not a, a promotion of vendetta. Nobody needed to wait for the law to promote vendettas. We're very good at it without it. Uh, the law actually just, let's say, organized it and interdicted like a, in the same way that uh, we saw that wealth, when it went over a certain threshold, it had to be given back in, in reciprocity. If you accumulate above a certain amount, you lose power. It doesn't increase your power, right? In a certain sense, from a different kind of measure, this sort of increase in violence based on, on resentment or the, uh, how do you call it? It passes on to the next generation, the need to complete the vendetta. So this generational increase of, of violence is cut off by- Phylogenetic violence. The phylogenetic violence, exactly. It's cut off by the law. A good example of this is Oresti, uh, the play, Aeschylus Orestes play, right? Where you have the whole cycle of violence and then Ath Athena appears and says, let's vote, <laughs> let's interrupt this here, right? It's the same structure basically, but in the, in the more, the Greek, Greek stuff is always more PG-13 than the Jewish. So it would be, it would be uh, D interrupting a logic of A. It's B interrupting. No, no, but the, Ah, but does it not have an element of D? I mean, you mean when it gives back things? Yeah, well, when it cancels, when it when it yes. ceases, when it stops. I think I think not. This this is something that I I have this doubt also. But I think I, what I imagine is that 
there is a logic of uh, uh, growth exponential debt in the strictly economic sense that uh, 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 is related to this kind of anthropological sense. Because I think what accum accumulation of debts leads to the decrease of the power of the state because it becomes a more privatized society. So there needs to be some kind of giving it back in order for the state to continue plundering. It's a kind of... It, yeah, yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is if you have a logic of the spiral of a, of a, of a vendetta system, which is a bad infinity, so to speak, the, the interruption of that seems to me, yes, it's uh, B to A, but I'm just curious if the logic of D is a regulative uh, logic that's also at work in that interruption. Um, yeah, uh, I I have the I, I I don't think that I mean I would be careful uh, just with the idea that when something good happens is mode D, because uh, at the same time only certain people can say that a vendetta cannot go on, right? Uh, uh, it's very it's a very specific relation that interdicts the continuity of of vengeance. It's not. Uh, uh, like a relation, it's not like I interrupt it because it's rational or it's better. It's it's something else. I mean, it it's the very structure the of the law. It, yeah. uh, it works against B. That's the point. It works against the, the logics of the state here. I don't think it does. On the contrary, that's the, I mean, I, what I understand that he's saying. No, is that I mean, if, if you allow vengeance to go spirally up, so then state loses its reason of being because all, all, all regulations of conflicts become private. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, my point is that this is the very, we're not talking about the inter, I mean, you could call, say that you have like, A could revenge, like you can have something like this forever, and then you have mode D as a sort of vanishing thing, and then you get mode B. Okay, but I don't see the need for this to account for mode B because yeah, that's why that's why uh, Hobbes call it the Commonwealth by fear. I mean, yeah. uh, it's the inter you you already have everything you need just by the inter inter yeah just and by the, limiting uh, the operator is the sovereign. It's not like the the same logic of operation as D, which is maybe a different form. Yes. Of yeah, yeah okay. where I, I, I'm gonna try to do something really weird about that. Uh, where, where he actually brings uh, religion in is in, the, in this fact here, that conquest is, conquest is not able to bring about the state. So he says, let's say this community won over this community. This is very unstable that this community dominates this one. It can be like a truce, like a false truce or something like this. So he says, we have an antinomy because the state cannot come from without, but it can also not come from within. Like this community here is not gonna create the state that dominates it, but at the same time, it would never accept if it came from the outside, right? And that's why he says uh, that, uh, so uh, let me just find the quote here. He makes a very Kantian way, like argument. So we can consider the possibility that a sovereign is not born from within the community, like we alienate ourselves in somebody. On the contrary, somebody comes from the outside and we exchange something with them, right? And there you become the sovereign community. But this can also not be true because the state cannot come from the outside uh, in the sense because it wouldn't have any legitimacy, right? And he says, we have a thesis that the state arises from very, he's totally paraphrasing Kant. We have a thesis that the state arises from within and the thesis is that it, the state does not arise from within, right? Uh, it, he says the antinomy can be resolved when we see that the origin of the state lies in a kind of exchange carried between ruling and ruled community, right? Uh, so it is inside and outside at the same time. Uh, and he actually will, will talk about uh, the role of religion as the expressing of this sort of contradiction. Uh, I just wanted to find it here. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
so in the form formation of the community state, religion played played an important a key role, right? Uh, because you had to find a way to justify. So uh, let me just see with a good quote here. Yeah, so at the stage of the proto-city state, the chief held much greater power than at the stage of the chiefdom state, now acting as priest in the service of gods who transcend the deities of the various members, member communities. So this is the big problem that we will have to solve, let's say, with, uh, with this state formation. Because at first, like, how do you translate that kind of cap threshold of wealth that required giving back in order for power to work, how can this translate into a structure where this can go on and you can actually accumulate indefinitely, right? This is mode A and this is mode B. So the idea that this somehow relates to, to some God, to some transcendence. So what was surplus before and would return in form of reciprocal exchange in this case, the surplus will be related to something outside of the world, right? Uh, to a new form of, of, of divinity and so on. Uh, so just to summarize, he, he goes through uh, what is the place of these two, of these communities. So he talks about Asian despotism and says, uh, so the community that dominates becomes like an aristocratic, aristocratic community. Uh, they their wealth comes from plundering the, the community that lost, right? And redistribution to, to them. But this is a sort, he says that this is actually a sort of, uh, this dominance doesn't mean that you totally govern the space that you dominated. You still keep a place for self-government inside of it. So there is a sort of weakened form of, of autonomy that is preserved. And we will see that it's actually very important uh, as we go along. And to complete, he says, well, uh, it would we already said that it would be impossible to, to establish the state mere, merely by military conquest, right? Merely by having one community that kind of does like this to the other. Uh, so the, the problem is that you need to kind of develop a norm that doesn't exist, that tells you how to relate in this way, right? And he says uh, that, uh, for example, the principle of eye for an eye, which marked the decisive break with the principles of reciprocity, was not a law that just really naturally, just naturally came about. It had to be expounded by philosophers. So I think that's where mode B appears, right? So imagine that you have that sort of asymmetrical relation that means that this community now has power over this, but to establish it, to make this stable, then you could say that mode D appears, right? And here we had that antinomy, right? And this antinomy can be interpreted as a, rela a problem of the relation between immanence and transcendence. Right? Is the state from outside or from within? Is the thing that is other to me outside of me or inside of? Am I inside of it? Right. So he he gives philosophers and, and religion a role to play in the stabilization of or expression of this norm. And I came up with this little schema here that I think is actually quite pretty, though I'm not sure if it's as consistent as it first seems. So imagine the following, right? This here in the bottom is like you have a community that lost, and we know that it, it develops its, its relations in terms of within the household, it's a zero space, right? You don't create spaces. Outside of the household, it counts spaces as one, and outside of settlements, it counts spaces as two. Now, imagine that you have a different community here with its zero spaces, its one spaces, and also its outside space, right? but it's now dominating this one. So it's kind of like doing like this, right? So here's the dominating situation. Here's the dominated one. 
And my unity is now inside of the other, and my otherness is inside of their unity, right? My, what, I, what was external to me is internal to them, and what was external to them is actually my interior now. So the funny little thing that I thought of is imagine that now you come up with a new ruler, a new space that puts all of this together here. If you count the number of spaces, these two spaces and one space form three, and these two with the two, one with the two form a tree as well, right? And here is the inside of my community is zero. It's left outside of the exchange. And the intern inside of your community is zero. It's also left outside. Well, but this structure here, a triadic structure, is precisely the structure of the law, right? The law has the structure of if I'm here, I abdicate something, you abdicate something to a third party, and this way we can exchange, right? When we enter into a social contract, I abdicate of my freedom, you abdicate of your freedom, both in name of some, of some third thing, and now we can relate between us, right? So for example, if we have a dominating community here and we have two dominated communities here, I know that I can exchange with them because both of us are submitted to this third instance. Or uh, in more modern terms, if I enter into a contract with B, I know that this contract here rules over both of us. That's why we can establish equal relations in a certain sense, right? So we can actually come up with a way of talking about this sort of Trinitarian structure of the law based on the fact that we're actually stitching together spaces that from, from the standpoint of who lost, right? The thing that was my other is now the one of a different community. And this community now rules over how people here relate. So it actually requires three spaces, right? Paul evangelizes the Greeks because they're all Romans, something like that. <laughs> Say it again. Paul is evangelizing the Greeks because they're all Romans. Yeah, exactly. Like from the inside of them, they're not, but from the outside, they are Romans. So yes. So uh, we'll, we'll see that this is actually helpful as we go along. It's not just me going, going nuts. Uh, one thing that I find very amazing that he says is that the first thing to kind of undo is a misunderstanding that says that despotism and this sort of Asiatic structure of one central dominating core with an, a lot of subdued, subdued communities is a sort of slave system. He says, no, if you actually look, uh, the masses are neither cruelly abused nor neglected. If anything, they're carefully safeguarded. And he says, this is where the structure of the welfare state comes from. And you can actually deduce it very nicely if you look at this. So here we have uh, a central community. Everyone is, it, it is plundering this, right? It, sorry, it plunders this and redistributes, right? Uh, the same thing here, right? So it plunders and redistributes. Actually, this is inverted. Uh, but if you look carefully, like when I plunder a community, I plunder only a part of what it has. But when I redistribute, I don't need to redistribute in accordance with this community. I can redistribute in accordance with all communities. So let's say I plunder one thing from here, two things from here, two from here, one, and one. When I redistribute, I'll, I'll redistribute the average of this. So I might, be able, I might be giving back more than I took. Right? So you have actually a sort of social system of redistribution and, and care that it's not necessarily, let's say, I give you what I took. You can actually be giving more than you took from certain places, which is how we call the welfare state. So the welfare state for Karatani is uh, just a development of Asiatic de despotism. Uh, it's not very, not very advanced. Uh, 
And the, set, well, the second thing that he introduces here that's very important, which is the question, why didn't this sort of state appear in Greece and Rome? Or at Rome at first, at least. And he talks about, this is why I added the red stuff, which is, let's say, commodity exchange, right? We will see that uh, here, th the central system is the mode B, but it also allows for a certain commercial relations between this unified state, right? But it can be the case where this is not how it goes. And for example, we can have uh, a state here where these guys dominate these guys, but the main form of relation with these other communities are commercial, right, mode C, or uh, reciprocal, mode A. So in this system, you can't really get this sort of centralized power because these guys here, they're in a different sort of relation to this smaller state here, right? And reciprocity, let's say, if these relations are kept, re reciprocal relations, they kind of bar the development or expansion of this form here further down. And we'll see that this is actually very crucial for him uh, later on. Uh, so again, he goes back to this idea that, well, what is the main form of power or what is the main form of, of of uh, the main technologies that allow for the development of this thing here, right? This big state with a bunch of communities inside where uh, plunder and redistribution actually organize the econo economy of this space. And he gives us, I think, five, five uh, properties, right? He says, well, money plays a crucial role. The written language plays a crucial role. Uh, actually, he goes later on into these things, uh, all the different details. But at this point, he says that the bureaucratic systems, again, the technology of organizing people actually has precedence over the, let's say, in, like this big sort of uh, displays of of uh, power or these big projects of uh, agricultural development and things like this. So for him, the main technology, this is the important sentence, technologies for governing people precede the technologies of governing nature. Uh, again, remembering that for him, people and nature, like it doesn't mean that there is a qualitative distinction between what exchange, what can be exchanged, only people can exchange. That's not the point, but the governing of people, so the reorganization of settlements, communities, and the, the technology you need to work through this is what, let's say, brings to light the, the sort of technological basis for you then to do uh, uh, other, other deployments of this logic, right? And for him, the, the whole point is that bureaucracy would never come about without the cash salary system. So the development of a very strong state relies on the possibility of exchanging uh, with money, of being able to pay people in a way that they're not really doing things out of volition or out of a common value system, but on the contrary, because they, uh, they have, let's say, their own private uh, interests settled. And therefore, they can just work as uh, service providers, right? So for him, the two main things here are for a bureaucracy to work, you need language, a written, written, written system, and you need a cash salary system. Those are the two preconditions for a bureaucratic system to develop. And I also tried this other crazy way of thinking about it. Uh, remember the thing that we were talking about, right? The internal of a community, the zero part, the connected space and its other, and the zero part, the connected space and its other. Now imagine that, right, my connected space rules over how you relate to your other, right? It's like a little triangle here. It's asymmetric because if I won, I get to say how you relate to me, but the inverse is not true. It's not symmetrical, right? So you get this sort of triadic structure where you have one relating to one via the other, 
but this thing here is in one community and this guy here is in another community, right? And this sort of having a third thing that mediates between two, but at the same time is something that you control. This is where writing and money coming, sorry? I think somebody this, this is like the imposition of American English on the world. Yeah, the, I mean, the imposition, I mean, the creation of vernacular languages, a dictionary, right? This, there is a really, really nice text by that Ivan Illich guy on, on the role of developing of dictionaries in the Span for the Spanish Empire to develop. And this idea of creating a certain common standard, right? But the crucial part is that the person who creates the common standard, right? This otherness, this external referee, is the winning community. And once it creates the external impartial measure, once you have this, you can relate to many different internal com spaces, right? Yeah, but that's true. But then you have um, empires like the Mongols who left a certain, uh, they arrogated like the, that third space to the people they conquered. So like they, they actually dissolved because the Islamic empire absorbed them from the standpoint of language and culture and so on, even though they had the military domination. So what I'm saying is it's not always necessary that this relationship of domination proceeds or follows from the winning community. I don't know. Yeah, but at the same time, you, you said it yourself, like they can, you, the, the point is that when you have this thing here, this sort of asymmetry between the, the ones that lose and the ones that win, like the establishment of the state as a sort of homogeneous space relies on, this is what I wanted to get at, like at this thing here, you need to come up with a way that the winning community kind of constitutes an order to all communities, right? Like the level of heterogeneity that this is allowed to have can vary. And this will be actually very crucial later on because it can actually Kind of bar the entry of a, a mark, a, a kind of world market or not, depending on how heterogeneous these things were kept. But this is this is very crucial for 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 his argument. And I just wanted to show that we can kind of develop, kind of extract this idea of a triadic structure out of the two uh, reciprocal measures that we had, right? Our reciprocal sticks, so to speak, right? So. What, I, what we, like our development is a sort of geometrical proof, but probably not that consistent, but it looks nice. Uh, but how this unsinking of reciprocity is enough of a basis for us to find a different way to glue the spaces in an asymmetrical way that is not unstable. It becomes a form of law, a triadic structure, rather than just a kind of, uh, uh, accidental overpowering that could be undone, right? So uh, he goes back to talking about uh, how, uh, let's see what we have here, just not soon. Yeah, he goes back to talking about the necessity of this sort of how mode C plays into mode B, right? Because once you have this sort of stuff with all the losing communities here and the winning here, and you want to make sure that this asymmetry becomes a, a, a particular structure. Like it's not simply an accidental thing. It needs to find its proper material support. And for him, the possibility of using this sort of impersonal relation, right, of commodity exchange to pay for, for bureaucrats and the use of kind of standards of language to guarantee some cohesion here. They're all conditions for the rule of the state to work. Uh, but at the same time that he introduces uh, commodity exchange as, or, or money as a condition for, for the state to, to expand, he also talks about the state as a condition for, for the development of, of commodity exchange. Uh, and this brings us to pro probably, let's say, I, I think it's one of my favorite parts of the book, uh, where he he shows that the way that uh, that Marx talks about uh, 
commodity exchange in capital, it's actually by bracketing uh, the relationship between property owners. So it's almost like this, lead, this minimal structure we're talking about here, where you have some, some other mediating the relations between A and B, right? Marx doesn't forget this. He just puts this into brackets, this sort of property structure, to talk about how commodity exchange happens kind of backed up by this, right? So I think that we can actually, like I tried to show in that little crazy graph that this sort of reci reciprocal measure of space, once you get them kind of unsynced and one is the ruling and one is the ruled, you can kind of arrive at this tri triangular thing, right? Which is actually uh, asymmetrical because let's say this is a ruled community, this is a ruled community, this is the ruler, the ruling one. It tells how they should communicate or how they should exchange. Or if this is the ruling one, right? This is asymmetrical as well. Something counts as, as the sort of pact, but I get to decide what it is and you relate to me and so on. Uh, but you can, we get to build on top of this when we get to commodity exchange, right? Where things are exchanged between them. And what he will show, which is very nice, is that the same contract that was valid for people gets with commodity exchange becomes valid for things. So things relate in accordance to a law in the same way that people relate in accordance with the law. And this is what we call the law of value. And he, he gives a sort of uh, uh, kind of parallel presentation to Hobbes. So he goes back to the first chapter of Capital, part three of the first chapter, right? Where Marx presents a simple form, the expanded form and the general form or the universal equivalent, the money form. Uh, and he shows, well, every, everyone knows, like, the, the simple form is divided between two parts, the relative and the equivalent. And this is important because this is not a mathematical equivalent. This is more like a predicate. So to say X of A equals Y of B is like saying X of A is worth Y of B. So there is an asymmetry. This is a subject and this is an object, right? Or predicate, sorry. So y of b expresses something about s of a, sorry, x of a. So the value is expressed here. So it's, they're unequal in the sides of the formula, right? So the expanded form is when I don't compare one thing with another thing, but I compare one thing with, I express its value in terms of many possible relations. And then you get the inverse, which is the universal equivalent, which is all things express their value in terms of one thing. Now, if you just move from uh, quantities of commodities to people, and for example, people who are communities that express their, 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 their exchange with others, you get us, uh, sorry. Okay, there is a parallel talk there. Uh, you get a very similar kind of social pact between things as we had between people, where this is a sort of particular encounter between communities. This is when uh, one community can exert, for example, its power over this one, over this one, over this one, or over this one. And this is where all of them abdicate of expressing their power so that they all express in one, one community alone. So for example, the idea of the sovereign as being one person that we all look to that person to see the whole, right? So for example, everyone is a citizen, but if I look at you, I see a private citizen. But when I look at the king, I see all the citizens, right? So that would have the same structure for Karatani as the move to the universal equivalent, which is the, the the separation of one commodity that now stands for the value of all other commodities. And so does this like say occupy a sort of like transcendental position can in this motion? Yeah, I mean I, I don't think it requires any transcendence proper, but it's let's say uh 
because I wonder if transcendence wouldn't be already us trying to kind of uh, equate this with with some religious thing, but you don't need that. I think it's better to think in terms of representation, perhaps, right? Wouldn't we say that when we elect somebody, he represents the whole, right? There will be a similar thing, like everyone, rather than me looking for somebody to represent me, like, or, or trying to find somebody to, to be my uh, representative, everyone abdicates from this and we assign one person alone to represent us all. So it's, it's like a functional theory of how commodities kind of mimic the social contract that people do with regards to a sovereign, right? It's kind of transcendent because at least I cannot but remember Son Hetel when he equates the transcendental uh, step in Kantian philosophy and the idea that everyone abdicates from, every commodity abdicates of its use value in the figure of, of, of exchange value. So in this sense, I think, but yeah, I, I got what you mean, you know, F, 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 it, it's abstraction from concreteness since you, uh, this commodity serves as a token for every other single commodities, then the pharaoh or whatever serves as a token for personalities in general. Yes, and you get mm. even the classic two bodies of the king, right, where this is a particular commodity, but it's also a universal stand-in right? This commodity, it's the thing that expresses the value of everything, but it's also just a use value. So in, in money, the distinction between use and, and exchange is a bit like the distinction between the king's two bodies as well. Uh, we could go into that as well. So, I mean, I do think that definitely you can interpret this in terms of immanence and transcendence, but I think that uh, tr it's good to keep that word for something that is out of the world. Okay. Transcendence is connected with out of the world. And I don't think that this is, this is part of the craziness of money. I want to say one thing, this is uh, very similar to, it's a tragedy that Karatani does not cite uh, Marcel Gaucher in his book, The Disenchantment of the World on the Political History of Religion, because he presents a very similar argument to the foundation of the state and monotheism as an inverse of transcendence. He basically says that transcendence becomes immunitized through the sovereign's centrality. So it's a very compatible argument, but I was looking and unfortunately Gaucher is not uh, a reference point for Karatani. Yeah, actually, I think that it's a good reason why it's, it's not because Gaucher... What's his name again? Gaucher? Yeah, Marcel Gaucher. Marcel, okay. Very uh, good book, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, okay, we can, we can schedule a separate meeting for me to, to talk <laughs> shit about Marcel Gaucher. Uh, it's one of those guys about, you know, democracy is the greatest thing that has ever happened. And, yes, but that's a separate issue from his historical, like, you know. Yeah, I'm sure it's totally separate. Uh, <laughs> you know, for, it's always like this. First, you call the state, like, everyone else was transcendentalist and they were all about believing in uh, like invisible powers and we moderns they dis we disenchanted the world and we need to democracy is all about the real yeah there's a really good counter to this in the work of eugene mccarraher who wrote an article called we've never been disenchanted um but then he also his big book that recently just came out he's uh he's done a lot of work to kind of dispel the myth of Weberian disenchantment so it's kind of a nice foil to that yeah, I, I have a bit of an issue with the disenchantment thesis because usually everyone else was enchanted. You were never enchanted. Only other people were enchanted. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a perfect way of establishing the psychoanalytic us versus them, right? Like we're yeah, the pure bit, and, they're, and they're the contaminated, contaminated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a bit of... But anyway, uh, I, I, we have a lot to go through. Uh, so this thing here, why is this interesting? Because the moment that you establish this idea that we actually used that triadic relation between one and one in the asymmetry there, mediated by another, and that this is at stake in, in here, we can now kind of build on top of the structure of the law to arrive at the structure of, uh, where did I have this here? Right, to arrive at the structure of, co of commodity exchange, where this is kept 
But this same structure now relates things and not people. And this is crucial because things can move between value systems in ways that people cannot. So uh, this is the first point that he will say, look, uh, yeah, sure, uh, this is a sort of contract of equivalence in the face of, a, of a one commodity. But once this commodity exists, once you have a universal equivalent, you just, let's say, established uh, the, this inequality. Because in an exchange, the person who has the commodity can only exchange it if the other wants the particular commodity that they have. The person who has money, he can exchange it with any other commodity. So he has, let's say, the universal pole, right? So you kind of mimic now at the level of commodity exchange the sort of difference between the ruling community here and the ruled communities here. This is kind of ingrained into it, right? A sort of fantastic sort of inequality. And, uh, but then at the same time that he says, look, money is important for the, mo for the states to develop. Money allows for the cash salary of bureaucrats. At the same time, money is its own form of exchange. This sort of uh, exchange between things uh, or relations between people mediated by relations between things, it's not, uh, it's not contained, but necessarily contained by the state that promotes it. So it can actually get out of hand. So this is what I try to write here, right? So the state, the minting of money or the, the loss on the owning of money by the state, they're all ways to try to keep money within a certain imperial formation or within the control of the state. But money actually has this sort of other side of it, which is that it doesn't connect people. So there is no reason why, let's say, if the state, the empire is here, and you have a ruling commodity community here and a ruled community here, that you need the states to, the empire to expand this way to be able to exchange with this people. So there is a sort of loosening of relations at the ground of commodity exchange that is actually in contradiction or in tension with the unification of the state space. Uh, so, uh, Karatani talks about, uh, where we have here, yeah. So he talks about, well, uh, and this sort of, this asymmetry between the particular and the universal in, in commodity exchange, right? Whoever has a commodity has a particular thing, whoever has money has a universal thing. Well, it, this is kind of the key for the inversion between the formula of commodity exchange and formula of capital, right? I just expanded it a bit here because we will need it later on. But the commodity exchange, you have a commodity, you exchange it for money, then you take this money either in the same place or somewhere else, you exchange it for a different com com commodity. You produce the first one, you consume the next one. This kind of reinforces uh, the producer, right? It kind of a circle of, self of social reproduction. Whereas the formula of capital is when you have money, you use it to buy commodities. Something happens here, you sell that commodity for more money. This is not actually necessary for the formula of capital. It's only for industrial capital. But you see, you begin with money and you end with money. And it's at a level of circulation that the circuit is completed, not at a level of consumption. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that you now accumulate money and not com com uh, commodity, right? Uh, then I'll just go very quickly. He talks about the three forms of, of capital. So the two, the two antediluvian forms of capital. One is I have money, I buy some commodities, I take them to a different system where they're valued differently and I exchange them for more money. So the spatial difference is where the surplus money comes from. Right? The usurer capital is even quicker. It's not really a spatial difference. It's simply money kept on hold over a certain different time. Then it's valued more. The different money comes from the interest rates you can charge over temporal displacement, not over spatial displacement. I lend you money now, you pay me in 10 days, but if it's 10 days, you pay me a delta. If it's 
a month, you a delta with a bit more because I had to be without my money for that time. So you have a second time, a second form of differentiation, right? You're exploiting spatial difference, you're exploiting temporal difference, and industrial capital is a bit more tricky than that. You don't really exploit space or time, you actually explore the difference between the value of labor force or labor power and the use of labor power or labor force. And the difference between the two, how much labor costs in the market and how much you can produce, the value that you can produce using it in, in certain ways. The difference between these two things is where the surplus come from, right? Uh, I mean, this we could spend a long time on this, but I'm just going to go a bit quicker. Uh, so he goes over this idea that well, surplus is always extra surplus value is always extracted at the frontier between value systems, right? Uh, and uh, I'll skip this because it's a bit too much for us right now. And okay, fine. And so, so when this, uh, when there's no frontier, which is nowadays capitalism, this frontier becomes within, kind of uh, the idea that you exploit abstract time of labor force to to create value. It's something like this. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there isn't. I mean, look at this thing here already. You, this should make us meditate on the question a bit because here we can easily understand like a community in a different community and we know that well uh, either I can exchange this between the communities or I can have a big state here and it goes to other big state here and they exchange spatially right uh, the same thing like I can I can already understand how in one system moving through time right system one and system one in a different moment I can also extract surplus in this way. This idea here that is neither time nor space is already very interesting because this already doesn't shift borders, right? And I mean, this is where the idea of an internal market will play a key role later on. That Britain started selling its com commodities for itself, right? So. The value of labor force was included in the market. People were selling their market, their, their labor in the market, and they were buying the com commodities back. It's only when this happens, when laborers buy back com the commodities so, so that they can survive, that you actually get, let's say, a system of surplus extraction, because now the value of labor is connected to the overall rate of productivity, right? Uh, so this is, I mean, we'll go, this is basically what we'll be discussing uh, throughout uh, the third part of the book, so I'll, I'll leave it be a bit, but it's very important to realize how crazy it is that this thing here is not really temporal, nor really spatial. And if I have your, if you still are here and after our next five meetings, I'll try to convince you that this is a scalar difference, that productivity is about dividing the same space into four parts or six parts or eight parts or combining the same activity in 10 like as if it was 10 activities 20 activities combining three laborers as if it were they were like doing one task or 10 tasks but it's the same space the same time you're like zooming in or zooming out on that's kind of how i would understand productivity is that very much based on simon don's theory of technology uh, but anyway uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna skip these things, but uh, there are so many messages on the on the chat. I'm gonna pretend I'm not seeing it. Uh, so I think that the important part at this point, just so we we actually get to arrive at the end, is that he he first says, look for for these big structures with a lot of small kind of communities and one central one to expand you need this sort of standardization, right? And it's important that it's a standardization because it's not the same as bringing your system of value inside of the, the other. It's kind of like creating an impersonal grid, right? 
And that impersonal grid has that structure that I mentioned to you guys, where you always connect one with another, not by kind of bringing them close together in a sort of perspectival or symmetric relation. This one comes close with this one via a third. And this is how they're connected. So it's not that they, their border is like symmetric. Their border might be asymmetric. This might dominate this. But the creation of this idea of a third, of something which is neither me nor you, it's both where the interdiction of vendettas is established, is where the idea of standardization is established, is where uh, the possibility of paying for somebody to do something and not really counting on you know, their discipline out of, out of uh, volition to have it accomplished, the development of international law as a third thing that regulates between things, it's always this sort of triadic structure, right? Which is, it's triadic, but it's not symmetric. It kind of tends towards one of the sides a bit more, right? And once he established this, he talks about, uh, let's say, the stru inner structure. He, he praises a lot uh, Wittfogel for, all, Carl Wittfogel for always having a sort of spatial uh, concern with these things. And then he kind of gives us this sort of triadic structure or, or the sort of triad here of how settlements are organized, how states are organized, or empires, and how uh, world economies will be organized, right? Uh, so this actually goes back to one of the questions we were talking about. So households within settlements, the federations between settlements, right? And if you have something outside, we know that this is a frail border. The other can, it has a sort of contingency here. So the other is kind of a danger in a certain sense. We can establish amicable relations, but if we don't, there is the possible overpowering and, and domination, right? In mode B, we get the distinction between a center which has relations of plundering and redistribution with a margin, but he adds this very special category of the submargin. And the submargin is again spatially described because just imagine the situation where uh, you get to kind of uh, control this. So you do get, let's say, uh, plunder and redistribution, but this is so far away that this sort of very strict kind of uh, domination is not possible. And he says, at the sub-margin, you kind of get a chance of choosing what of the empire system you want to interject and what of other forms of relation like mode A or mode C you want to keep, right? So for him, this is a very important category because it's, it's sort of like a, a, a sort of kind of indeterminate sort of social formation, right? Uh, for him, Greece, for example, will fall here. Later on, Brit like even though France and Germany were clearly margins of the empire, Britain was kind of outside a bit and it could pick and choose the sort of uh, let me see if I can get the quote here. Uh, yeah, for example, he says, uh, I forgot where the quote is from. I thought he, he talked about Britain so much. Yeah, here. So the capacity of adopting only selectively the civilization of the empire is not some quality unique to Japan, which is another one of the sub-margins of an empire, but uh, rather a characteristic shared by all sub-margins. For example, even with, within Europe, we find differences between regions that were on the margin and sub-margin of the Roman Empire, whereas France and Germany displayed characteristics typical of margins, carrying on systematically the concepts and forms of the Roman Empire. Britain lay on the sub-margin and hence was able to adopt a more flexible, pragmatic, unsystematic, and eclectic stance. This is why Britain, turning away from the continent, was able to construct a maritime empire and become the center of the modern world system. 
and also the U.S. It's interesting. He does yeah. Mention. Yeah, he mentions it later on, I think. Okay. Uh, America is the end of the world, literally. Yes. Uh, true. So the thing here is that we see that, and we will follow this later on with more detail, that these sub-margins, usually they either become the core or the semi-periphery of a world system, of a world economy. Uh, so margins, either the core absorbs all of this, uh, or it becomes, a, so either this goes here or here, but this sort of special social formation, kind of hybrid social formation, tends to become, kind of, kind of move up the ladder in a world economy, because precisely it was able to keep relations of commerce and a sort of social heterogeneity uh, with other cultures uh, during the empire times as well, right? So, and, and, and he also comes up with this idea of the autosphere because empires have spatial boundaries. We, we talked about this idea that they have logistical limits, right? So if the limit for, for a federation is this sort of idea of, of an otherness that is a sort of danger, here the limits uh, of this of the world empire is a logistical limit because there is a point that coming all the way here to plunder these guys it's much more expensive than the things that you're gonna get from them so at this point this is a, there is a material limit right we will see later on that there is no such limit in capitalism because the periphery itself goes to the core to sell its stuff so rather than the arrow being like this first and then this second, the arrow is this. And actually the, the return arrow is not that common. It's actually quite distinct, right? And semi-peripheries are not like sub-margins, like at the, the brink of the outside. The place where you get intermediate is actually at the middle. So for example, a country that has specific kind of logistical relations with the core, so it benefits from special taxation, or from banking uh, laws and things like this. And, but at the same time, it's not, let's say, kind of a place of concentration of, of capital in the same sense as the core, right? But there is no out of sphere anymore. There is no outside here. So this leads us then to that other question, which is once we get to world economies, what does, in, what does an in-between mean? because we have a sense of the in-between here as a sort of contingent membrane of a federation. And we get a sense of a, both of, of a border here, which is a logistical threshold and a sort of incarnation of the in-between with the sub-margin. But we don't get any of these two things here. I'm kind of, I'm kind of getting the, there's a shadow of trans critique in these chapters then. Um, particularly because if this sub-margin is somehow capable or characterized by this transpositional or transversal movement between inside and outside. And also, it seems like the, the other antinomies he mentions, um, imminence, transcendence, within and without. I was wondering if you think mode D is only perceivable in the parallax between these various antinomies? And yeah, therefore, I think... you mentioned in between this, so therefore is D an attempt to limit exchange to transcritical or parallax relationships? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I, he, two things that I think by, by, this, by this, at this point of the development is already clear is that you always find all modes inside every social formation, right? So we know that B is kind of kept here, but it's, it's a necessary kind of supplement, or even if it's negated, and that C exists here, we know that within these communities, mode A exists, right? And that commercial relations within them and also with the outside other, other empires, for example, or states exists. And we know that this thing here is a state with communities inside. So all of these other modes are inside of all of them. And this is valid for D as well, right? There is both, let's say, animism, magic, forms of godliness here, forms of godliness that are appropriate to mode B, and we will see in a very strange way how they, it all plays 
into mode C as well. Uh, but I don't think that we need uh, mode D to talk about in between. In between, it's the only thing we have, right? When we were talking about like reciprocity and we spoke about not creating spaces, creating one space or creating two spaces, it's about, let's say, giving a form to what is in between, in between households, in between settlements. When we spoke about like how in, in unequal relations between like two different com communities can be brought together, right? So that my outside become your inside and your outside become my inside, something like this. We're also kind of redefining what is the in-between and that's the law. So there's everything are different ways of constructing the connection of space. So in a certain sense, everything is about the in-between. And for example, we use the transcritical or the parallax view uh, to talk about how the state is born outside, but not outside of community. So it's always already at play. So I don't think that's enough to define what. Uh, but maybe like non-triadic is the key thing. So yeah, I think, parala I think parallax is non-triadic and maybe that's where D comes through. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is how he later on in the, just to kind of very brief about the part on religion, right? So this is how he distinguishes the four modes, right? He says mode A is all about equality, but it's com coerced equality, compulsory equality, right? Mode B is both unequal and compulsory or coerced. Mode C is unequal, it's asymmetric, but it's mutual consent, it's free. It doesn't bind you either by states or by community, right? But it's unequal. And mode D would be both equal and free, right? I just added here the fact that we move from A to B by that, that commonwealth, that social pact. We move from B to C with a sort of move of the property rights to things themselves rather than to people, right? We move from C to D, uh, we will see later on, very much on this discussion on Kant about means and ends, right? What it means for people never to be things, in a certain sense, or things themselves never to be things as, as uh, in a certain sense. And we know that he relates A to D as a sort of return in a higher level of complexity or whatever, right? So when he goes, to, he, he talks about mode D in, in, at the end of, the, of this big uh, section on world, world empires. I'm just gonna go over this. This is my current proposal. So if we talk about mode A as a sort of reciprocity, where is the relation that determines what, where people stand, right? And relations are dual and symmetric. We spoke about the mode B as the invention of this third. It can be a standard, it can be a, a sort of transcendental thing beyond communities, it can be a, a sort of social pact that we all respect equally, right? but it's a sort of triadic structure. And we saw that we can also build on, I'm, I'm keeping the color just to see that they kind of, there's still space for the previous layer on top within the new one, right? And we can move to, to mode C by shifting the relation between people to relations between things in such a way that people don't relate when things relate, right? And we saw that well, this doesn't make it equal because things can establish a social pact where this is a universal thing and this is a particular thing, just like this was a, a particular person and it was a universal one, right? Uh, my idea for the mode D, if we were to write it down here, perhaps could be like this, where you see it's no longer symmetrical. It, it, the, there is no arrow here. I give you something, but in giving you something, I'm not giving something to you. I'm giving something to X. And this is my reward. So it's like gift without a counter gift because I give something to you, I lose, you win. But the fact that you won is my win. Right? So the very effort of doing something for the other is its own reward. Or in another word, it seems like this is an end in itself. At the same time, it is a means for me to receive something back. So you can see from this kind of, it's, I don't think it's a final proposal, but it, I think it's an okay proposal because you can see that it's different from all the three previous ones. This is not a compulsory thing. 
It's not symmetric. I don't need to assume that the other is like me when I do this. Like me in the sense that it is a thou, but I'm not, not also assuming that it is an it. It simply doesn't, it doesn't have that compulsory symmet symmetrical aspect. On the other hand, it's not equating universality, so this third thing, to any particular third thing. It's not a standard, it's not a law, it's not a god. So it doesn't have the form of a one, right? And third, it's not, it doesn't allow you to treat people as things. Because you never see the thing only for what it appears, you also see it for in the, it, it is a mediator for this other higher thing, right? So it could be perhaps a way of talking about, uh, about, about it that you can see some relations to mode A, B, and C, right? Uh, and you can imagine that in the history of, you know, social formations, we have many names for this thing, like nature is a third thing to which everyone is submitted, but it's not God or reason or God himself in a mystical sense or a sense of otherness and ethics or a sense of nothingness itself or a sense of the commons or whatever. So perhaps, perhaps this is a way to approach this, I'm not sure. But it's also useful, I think this way of thinking about it, it's also useful because you can see that Karatani spends a long time in this chapter, and, and we don't have time to go into it, but talking about how this thing here appears in empires as a critique of, of this, sorry, as a critique of this. So prophets, prophets, uh, philosophers, everyone is kind of critiquing this sort of reification, fetishization, uh, true com commercial relations and power relations. But at the same time, this sort of uh, pointing to a higher thing uh, also benefits the state. So you have this structure where uh, mode C is destructing mode A, right? Uh, this sort of relation is substituting this sort of relation. Communitarian relations are being substituted by commercial relations. Uh, and so you have this thing happening. This thing is a critique of this, but it also plays a part in the establishment of the empire because it brings something universal into play. It has a sort of proto-triadic structure, perhaps, right? Uh, it leaves this empty place here that you could play something particular, perhaps. So this is a, like a universal in some weird sense, and you can place a universal in a more positive sense, perhaps a negative universal and a positive universal, perhaps. Right, and he spends a long time at the end of the chapter talking about this. I mean, I, 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 I think next time we can, we, can, we can talk about this a bit more since, I mean, I didn't really have time to go into the whole religion discussion, which is very, very precise and there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, but I think it's, it's enough just, just to get this, this, I mean, this feeling that when you, which is something that I really want us to kind of arrive at. Like we went through a lot of stuff today and you kind of get this sense that we're building something like this. And then this thing here has other stuff here. And then this connects with this other stuff in a broader thing. Like you're kind of increasing the amount of layers in your analysis. But this doesn't mean that these other things are not kept preserved inside of it somehow, right? For example, here. Uh, and to analyze mode C is about, you need to kind of bracket this to, to be able to see this appear. Things are related, people are not related. Or producers only relate through the things that they exchange or whatever, right? In the same way that to analyze the law, you kind of bracket the communal relation and you kind of, this leads you to an abstract description of an individual relating to another individual through the law, which like Hobbesian analysis, right? So uh, this idea that you can imagine a very complex kind of network of things that relate, for example, these two things here relate via thirds, but they also relate reciprocally and here as well. Uh, this guy here only relates to this other one here through commodities that they exchange. 
So you get like a very complex tissue. And depending on the measure stick that you bring, some things will be intelligible and some things will be not, right? That's, I think, a way of talking about how scalar resolution, right? Because we almost distinguish this in terms of numbers, right? Here we go from zero to two. Here we need three. Here we need, I don't know, four, right? If you have, if you look at things in terms of fours, you will see something. If you look at things in terms of thirds, you will see something else. If you look in terms of, at things in terms of dual, you will see something else. But they're all true. They're all there at the same time. But somehow you need to kind of ad ad adjust your resolution, the number of bits. Right? Perhaps you could say that here you have a two bit, here you have three bits of information, and here you have four. Right? There is a difficulty also, I think, in imagining mode D. And I keep thinking of a metaphor uh, in modern physics because all these physics professors, they try to explain fourth dimension in the idea that we cannot represent it, but only have a glimpse at what, as what would a shadow of it appear in third dimension. So I think it's, it's kind of similar that you can have a representation of what it is to have a two dimension or a one dimension. So if you look backwards, you can represent what it is like, but you cannot see it forwards. Like you cannot see, uh, you cannot have the representation of a higher uh, uh, dimension. Similarly, you cannot have a representation of mode D uh, since we are now at, let's say, the third dimension of world history, to put it. Yeah, I like that idea. Perhaps 4D is actually... So like, like actually re 4D. Real existing socialism is hypercube's shadows of, you know... <laughs> <laughs> socialism. <laughs> I like that. Is this linked to the problem that D can never exist on its own? Is this because I the way I've been thinking about it is A, B, and C all depend on a clear distinction between belonging and not belonging, whereas D seems to be a kind of overcoming of the antinomy between belonging and not belonging, even temporarily. And so D is a kind of internal pressure within all of the other ones uh, that in some societies becomes a kind of organizing principle, which is the nomadic thing. So it's, it seems kind of unrepresentable to me sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, this is part of the reason why I'm trying to push really hard for this idea that these relations here, they construct spaces rather than uh, map them or relate spaces that already exist. Because we get to this particular problem, like this thing here, it covers all the space. Right, there's no space to cover. So the idea that you develop like new forms to cover more space, right? This sort of, uh, we kind of exhaust the spatial metaphor at this point. That's why I'm trying to describe everything already with a connection of scales. Because since yeah, the only mode, characteristic- mode Yeah? Yeah, well, I was gonna say mode D seems to fit really well with his elaboration of the zero sign in architecture as metaphor where he talks about, um, I actually just pulled up a little, a little quote here, but like the zero sign serves as a proxy for God or the transcendental ego. And um, he obviously talks about that with regard to like the floating signifier and Sasor and, and stuff like that. But it seems that at least it's, it's operation, it's function. That we could think of mode D as operating sort of like a zero sign or the, the absolute um, kind of repetition of in, indifferentiation. And so it kind of serves as a, a sort of transcendental, if you will, zero that is perpetually repressed, but that is perpetually returned in its form of repression as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that when we get to the, to the discussion of mode D later on, uh, it will be very good to kind of draw out the sort of all the presuppositions that we're accumulating in the way Karatanik presents it, because there is a lot of kind of hospitality, Derrida, uh, a sort of kind of uh, this relation with mode A, all these things kind of are piling up to sort of lateral description of, of mode D. And I think that uh, we need to be careful because uh, when I, I, I do think that we should have a lot of respect for the fact that philosophy has been a sort of depository of concerns about absolute equality and free association in many profound senses. But at the same time, 
uh, it's I think we should find a way to put our put the challenge to ourselves in terms that are the same as all of this until now. Like everything we did with we did with these other three modes was about undoing abstraction, right? In the sense of idealizations or theories, we, you kind of start getting a very concrete feel for how this stuff organizes space and produces space and produces out of boundaries. So I think that uh, we should only be satisfied with our description of Modi when it does the same thing for us in the sense that it doesn't require a sort of uh, philosophical uh, framework to make itself intelligible and it becomes a form of exchange, right? For me right now, uh, the easiest way to talk about it is really the stupidest one, which is people do, thing, do things where doing is its own reward. Th this is the contradiction for me. Like, how can you organize a society where you do things, you, the, the, the reward is the thing itself, right? And this is why I think there is a connection with this idea of means and ends and politics and all art and science, all these things that if you, you can never really reduce the, the act of doing it to a sort of concrete re reward you get from it. Like the process is the reward. The problem is that if this is the case, let's say you can imagine somebody producing like new information for B and B producing not new information for C ba based on mode D, right? Nothing guarantees that th this will happen and that this person will actually, like, I lost materially something here and this guy gained. He lost something and this guy gained. I didn't get anything. I, I might starve. So the only way to balance this triangle of pure gift giving is if one of these three other modes closes it. Com some compulsory form where this guy needs to give and I need to get, right? I think that for now, for me at least, the most concrete version of this problem is this one. Like, what does it mean to organize a society where this guy gives to this, this guy gives to this, and, and he, and I say, in a certain sense, it is itself its own return, but materially it's not. So would you, would you organize yourself based on this form of free association if you weren't sure that there is a compulsion that will make you get something back? Because what money does is precisely that I give you something, but I get money and you get the commodity. This guy exchanges here and this guy gets the money. The commodity. I know that now that I have money, I can buy something. I have universal rights of consumption, so I won't starve. So this arrow here is closed. If I lost and he gained, he lost and he gained, he will, he can lose and I can gain what I need. Isn't this, isn't this something that approaches the argument of the labor voucher that uh, Karatani also points to in his text and is, a, is, is an opportunity for Marx's criticism of, of the- Proudhon and so on. Non, yeah, non-scientific socialists and so on. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to show. I, I get what the difficulty is. We 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 sort of feel what it is like, but it's it's hard to imagine. How would this this circle enclose? Yeah, I mean, for me, this is called. You know, Freud has a text, the economical problem of masochism. I call this the economical problem of militancy, because yeah. this right. is basically it. Like, sure, it's true. Politics is its own reward in a certain sense. Yeah but it doesn't close yeah right so you always need this thing here to be mapped on top of this other stuff like voluntarism and faith state funding or non-governmental yeah. yeah. organizations or whatever because this so, thing doesn't hold let, on its own. let me ask you something you 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 like enrolled some names for this x 
uh, and that and and you mentioned correct me if I'm wrong but you mentioned that there were some names for this X and you listed like nature God and stuff like this yeah I took from one of his quotes here I forget where it is why not state because I think this is a problem in a sense because I know in one sense it's obvious why not because state yeah because is that's that's mode B that's the name of mode B yeah. <laughs> But also there is a kind of, I don't know, maybe we, um, because the abolition of state in Marx's statement is not as simple as the simple abolition of state. I don't know how to say yeah. it. It's like... Because in mode D you can leave the state, whereas in B it doesn't make sense, right? Like the yeah. definition of V is you, there's no voluntary exit, whereas D involves voluntary exit. Mm -hmm. You see, like the, the, the way that I think about these things here is that uh, you, you can think of them in terms of finding a lower common ground, but you can also think, and I think this is what he tries to do, right? World Republic. Oh my God, I, I managed to World Republic. Because yeah. you can either look for a, like philosophy, I would say that you, philosophy in the inverse of politics, when you get to this problem, like we have many communities, this one's form a state, and we know that when we have different states, we can use money to exchange between them, right? And then we ask, okay, but what else can you have? Like, how can you, uh, how can you find something more general than this? Philosophy tends to look for something that is fundamental, like ontology. So how we all are, or like being is a givenness or whatever other philosophical truism you want. Like philosophy tends to go this way and try to find like some, some sort of fundamental thing, even if it's not fundamental in the sense of a building block, but just usually sort of a homogeneous background. Whereas we could talk about politics being something that tries to go up. Like how do you construct something that is of a higher scale, not of a lower scale, right? Not of a, of a, it's not finding the constitutive building block where this, all people- This is what I mean, because the, the, the abolition of states some, sometimes looks like hyperstate, like- Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I, I do think that Karatani is kind of a bit, I mean, it's his own, it's this whole thing. It is very like low res about, state abolition as if people were all very crude about it okay okay right i i do agree with you but at the same time i think his critique of it is that uh he says uh it, it's almost like you had to find a pact for this right and fascists find a pact with this so it's a plus b against c sorry it's it's like D becomes A against B and C, that's fascism, right? And D becomes B against A, C, that's socialism, right? But you never get D against B, A, C, right? Against the three of them. And that's what he wants to get at. And this supposedly didn't exist yet, right? And uh, you I have cannot... a question about this. Sure. Uh, you know, you could actually flip C and glue it to the bottom of D to get D like uh, preserving the structure of C, right? Because like now this. that, yeah, now that the relation of things is what mediates relations between people and C, it opens up a space there. Like here. Yeah, and then this, well, this would be law, right? And below that as well, law of value. So just exactly the ah, inverse of C. Ah, okay, so, so this is like this still. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with. I mean, the 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 reason why I think this is very complicated is that we, you also see that what people mean at each of these states, the situations, is very different, right? So this this here creates the idea of an individual, right? This is actually not necessarily a person. This, for example, can be a family, right? The sexual division of labor in between productive and, and unpaid labor that comes up with things. So what we actually call people, what we call these units here, can actually va vary a lot. So when we talk about this thing relating people, 
it might not even be what we call people, right? Uh, so what would these things have to be so that they give the measure of where things can, where the law of value can transit, right? Yeah, I was just thinking like in, in maybe academia or science, the scientific community, for example. I mean, yeah. there's clearly some aspect of like getting research grants and, you know, there's some amount of dealing with the relations between things that must happen in order mm -hmm. for the work of science to happen. So mm -hmm. it's almost like the, the mode D is, is parasitic on mode C, at least yeah. in, its, in the current form. Actually, I mean, just to, just to conclude, since we are going through, just since we're trying to solve world peace here, uh, one thing that I think is a, also a, a nice kind of uh, uh, hint at this, and I, uh, just because Dennis said something and I remember that we had this discussion another day, is that if you want to find a limit for this thing here, you could think of it in a different way. Like, let's say we have a bunch of communities, this is a state, this is as well, right? And we know that what's special about mode C is that it can do this between states, right? So this is mode C. But mode C has a particular condition, which is it has this unifi unifying condition. So the, the intersection between this state and this state needs to be world money. The intersection between this and this state needs to be world money and here as well. So these intersections are all made of the same thing, right? There is one standard, one form, right? It's decentralized, but it's actually a unified decentralization, right? Because you, you still keep this basic structure behind it. You could imagine, I mean, and this is the distinction between this and this, that the law of value is a one form of decentralization. It has a unity, even though it's decentralized, but you can have a multiple form here. So you can imagine, for example, that you have a state with com communities inside and they exchange here in accordance with X1. Then this other state exchanges with this other one on X2. And these two things are not the same. So the intersection between this is X1. The intersection between this is X2. The intersection between these guys here is X3. And these three things are not the same. So there's still something to let loose from here to here, right? That's why I think philosophy is so interested in this problem, right? The idea of how do you move from having something that is a, a universal one that binds the multiples. And for the last, I don't know, 100 years, most, if not much longer, most, most of philosophy is concerned with how do you move from one universal to the to universal that is multiple, right? And what could this mean? So to detach this X here from the one, because then you could imagine a way of gluing space that actually would be distinct from C, right? Because C, even though it glues spaces that are heterogeneous between each other, and it is able to glue them together, it's also only able to glue them together if they fit to the commodity form, which is a, one, a particular form, right? It, it's more general than this one, right? but it's still a unified one. So you could imagine, let's say, a multiple sort of structure here. Uh, so, I mean, there's also that clue, but I, I do think that it's important to kind of, because this is an, I think this is really crucial, you know, like to, uh, to be wary of the philosophical version of these problems, because it, it is an economic and organizational problem. Like, what is to freely associate? I think that's, that's the thing we're trying to think when we're trying to conceive of the relation between mode A, B, and C with regards to D, right? 
We're kind of borrowing from these modes to think about free association. Uh, it's not a, it, it's philosophical because that's the best we can do. It's not essentially a philosophical problem. It's an economic problem. That's why I think that that little, that little diagram here with the fact that this thing goes here and this goes here, you know, but this arrow is not guaranteed because there is no compulsion. It kind of gives that's us the- what I, I think it's, that's minimum. why I really like the, the bits that you put about that X is kind of a placeholder. Cause one of the things that I find, cause he doesn't, he doesn't spend as much time emphasizing this, but I still feel like there's an overemphasis on a negative form of freedom throughout this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that mode D is always free from compulsion. It's free from the state. It's free from um, certain dogmatic impositions of religion. And so what you get in the universal religion is um, a sort of like uh, liberation out of that, sort of like a avoid universalism, right? And, and I think that's powerful, but at the same time, I think it also neglects from an economic perspective, it neglects understandings of rights that are actually not just rights um, of exclusion, but rights not to be excluded from, which have existed for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So the right not to be excluded from participation you're in saying, the state, the right not to be excluded from the commons. So you're Go ahead, you need B. You need a little bit of B. I think, yeah, if, um, if B is understood in terms of the right not to be excluded from, absolutely. And that's what's interesting. So yeah. not to go full Machiavellian here, but ab that's, that's why a lot of the theories of transition from feudalism to capitalism, they totally misunderstand that element of rights, right? And I think that's something that I feel like he doesn't, at least not ex expended much energy developing, but I really like when you put over the X that it could be the commons, it could be nature, it could be something, because it feels like that's maybe some sort of um, notion of positive liberty that needs to also supplement his more negative theory. Yeah. I and then, yep. I, say like, I think as well that the fact that he constantly like repeats that you don't completely get rid of any of these modes kind of sort of might address that sort of problem in that like moving to mode D doesn't necessarily mean like we're completely eradicating C, yes. B, and D. Yes. So I think. I totally agree. I think that that's very important that it's not about undoing the previous mode, right? I think, but, but again, I think the more we think about this in terms of connecting spaces, the better it becomes because we saw how mode A organizes this sort of spaces. We saw how mode B kind of connects these things in an asymmetric sense, right? Giving a plus here and a minus here. And we know that this allows for mode C to develop in a way that goes beyond uh, beyond a given state, right? Uh, with its own kind of concentration of wealth here and removal of wealth from here and so on. I think it's nice to imagine this in a sort of gourmet way as a sort of what it means to come up with a different structure here, because it's kind of like either D appears here or it will appear below to kind of ease the relation between A, B, and C, right? Uh, and I don't think I don't think D is a structure. I think when he talks about D is emerging as some kind of deconstructive impulse. I think D is a kind of different regulatory logic that never could yeah. be consolidated into a structure. Well, but then yeah, he calls it's like it a world it's like a converting. Yeah, but, but he does specifically say that it is precisely never appears in itself. It's only an ideal form and it's always deconstructive. And so there's something that it seems to function as a kind of uh, regulative and normative converting principle. So it converts mode C so that you can actually have relations between people in the exchange of goods and services uh, via some sort of legal structure. It converts mode B so that you can have some semblance of like a, a superstructural state or something like that. So you can have that positive freedom for, but it does that all according to some sort of like fundamental, maybe it's the secular otherness, but some sort of um, the, uh, the Kantian uh, um, categorical imperative. And so it's the categorical imperative that converts the previous modes, but while kind of, not in a Hegelian sense, but while transcending them at a higher level. Does that make sense? So it's got a, a, like, in it, that's, that's why it's world, that's why world religion is so important. And he looks to somebody like 
the prophets, because that's precisely what the prophets do, right? Is Jesus is contesting the Levitical order precisely so that he can kind of like raise it to a higher level, like maybe to realize what was in principle truly always supposed to be the point, but without essentializing, there's a regulative converting logic that becomes but universalized. Isn't, isn't the point though that we can think uh, the autonomy of D as a concrete structure, like within. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I think for reason... example, for example, uh, Karatani gives a concrete idea at the end of the book, and he gave already one inference critique, which is the idea that from the standpoint of D, we can segment C into local money. Uh, and that this sort of connection between A and C, where A kind of uh, contains C, right? And then communities are related through free association and exchange is localized through local money. It's already a way of gluing this space in a new way based on this over overarching principle, right? So, I mean, there are, I mean, I agree with you guys that there is a lot of a lot of deconstructive talk and negative explanations, especially in the in the in mini world systems and world empires. Even though at the level of world uh, universal religions, mode D starts getting some flesh. Mm -hmm. It has specific critiques. It has a form which is the communities of individuals separated from from state and and capital and uh, and communities, right? The idea that individuals can get together only based on belief, which is neither state nor their communal kinship ties, not based on interests. It's already a concrete version of it, like community of believers, right? So, but the fact is that the only form of organization known until the level of empires based on Modi was religious community. So that's a concrete version of it. I just think that when we talk about it in terms of philosophy, we can get lost sometimes because uh, it's of the very grammar of philosophy sometimes to block the positive expression. Because if you say the positive expression of something which has no rule, you gave it a rule and that's kind of problematic for philosophers usually. Whereas politically and organizationally, organizationally uh, is not so hard, right? And he does start bringing this in and it is this connection from communities of believers that will lead us to Thomas Munzer, uh, peasant revolts, and to socialism, right? And to the project of something which is gonna break with, uh, with uh, capital, state, and nation. But what he says is that the strategies to do this thus far have made that to break with C, you normally choose an ally, which is either B or A. And that's where the problem lies. So. Uh, I would say that we have a more precise positive problem, which is what else can you trust if not B or A in order to break with C? It's not that he gives no content to D as a sort of organizational principle. No, he does give, he goes into joint ventures and cooperatives. And I mean, I would say that actually Karatani's work is one of the few that has like concrete, you might not like them, but you have local currencies, cooperatives, uh, uh, blockages at the level of circulation, uh, uh, examples of what it means for a nation to give a gift without a counter gift, with this, which is a relieving of your military force. Like he has some content to these things. I think it's that the very fact that we need to kind of hold in check our desire to solve this problem conceptually, like. That's the hard part, you know, to think of it in terms of, okay, but what of this stuff actually gets a, a sort of, in which sense is this a way of building space, right? And, and what is this common thread of, of kind of space production that Modi is capable of? And it does seem like it's mostly a force of unbinding. And I think that's very true. So it's very negative, uh, but that unbinding is, that's the, let's say, I, I want to get into this later on, but I could I would say that sacrifice is the paradox of mode A, right? You destroy in order to give. That's really weird. Like it's a weird kind of paradox. 
sovereignty is a paradox of mode B because you are and you are not inside the law, right? Uh, abstract labor is the sort of paradox of mode C. Again, it concerns, are you in circulation or in production? Like, is it concrete or abstract? The, all, the whole kind of uh, uh, paradox of surplus value and that, you, that you can extract out of it. And I think that this precise relation between binding and unbinding is the paradox of mode D. How can it be that non-relations form better relations, right? How can it be that you're closer to somebody when you are impersonal than when you are personal? Like that's a sort of crazy part of, of this structure here. And that, it goes back to what we were saying. How can it be that giving without asking might make this possible, right? Might be a form of social coordination. That's the crazy part of it. And it all goes back to this idea that you unbind, and this is a sort of binding. So you unbind for your community, from the laws, and from your personal interests, and this forms a community of believers. You unbind from you know, your nation, from your state, and from your social position, and you become a communist, right? It's always this sort of weird binding and unbinding. And I think Karatani brings to the table the idea that if you think of this as the production of space, and if you think of this as an added layer on top of this, rather than about abolish, abolishing all these other layers, but kind of giving them their proper measure, giving them their proper kind of realm, right, or domain, fixing their domain, uh, this thing here becomes more tractable than if you think that it needs to substitute all of this altogether, right? Uh, which I think modes of production tends, of, tends to suggest that modes of production, this comes before this and this comes before this, right? With modes of exchange, you get these things kind of overarching each other and things like this, right? So it, it's, it really kind of shifts our perspective on how to approach it, I think. But I, 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 I'm not saying that this is a bad thing or a good thing, but there is a very peculiar or particular Protestant logic in this whole idea. Um, the idea of like from Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, that the law will be written on your heart. Um, so it's no longer going to be controlled by the Levitical priesthood and the Levitical order and like it's governmental and sovereign strategy. Then Jesus kind of takes that up with the whole idea. You've heard it said not to commit murder, but I say that even if you have hate in your heart, then you've committed murder against your neighbor, right? And that the law is reduced both in Jesus and in Paul to uh, the singular idea of to love your neighbor because loving your neighbor is loving God, not that they even need to be separated, right? Um, Jesus says that they're two, Paul says they can be reduced down to just the one, right? So there's something interesting then about this internalization that really sort of reaches its peak. And he draws, Karatani draws so much from Weber um, and even Kant that I wonder if there isn't this sort of like, and this is another thing that's made me a little bit uncomfortable, a sort of like personalism um, and this idea of this individual um, emphasis on an individual personalism. Dude, but, but he was criticizing this. Like, this is mode D under mode B. Yeah. Like, right? This is not, let's say, world republic. He's, he's saying that this is, let's say, the place that mode D got in the formation of empires. It, the, the kind of dialectics between universal religions, monotheism, and, and empires. This is not, let's say, the, the, the map for anything to be done. This is just where mode D was able to appear. This sort of weird internalization, which is meant to allow you to unbind from the community, but it's at the same time a further reinforcing of it, right? So that's just, let's say, historical description of something that happened. It's not a model for anything. Uh, and I mean, I think that when we get to Soviets, free association, communes, venture, uh, venture capitalism, and things like this, you start to see that within the world economy, the re-emergence of mode D is very different from the emergence of mode D inside of mode B. So for now, everything we discussed was inside of this. It's like systems where mode B is the main one, mode C is contained within it, and it's relating mode A. Then mode D is kind of like here, right? It's inside of mode B. And it's yeah, we, either, it's in a contradiction with it, but inside of it. We're still going to see when this happens. 
C is dominant with states and communities, and D is like here, trying to negate it, but also kind of close to it. We still okay. haven't... It's almost like one way to say it is we lack a theory of religion where D is the dominant mode of exchange. We've never had that, right? It was yeah. always peripheral. You see my point. So yeah, uh, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting kind of historical paradox in some sense. Yeah, I just, I just want to like defend Karatani on this point. I don't think that he, I mean, I do think that he wants to establish a linearity, like a historical lineage from religion to and philosophy all the way to socialism, but he's not making it so that everything is transitive. There is a big rupture here that we're seeing from the next chapter, in fact, right? Uh, that we're about to, to talk about next time, right? Which shifts everything. It's a sort of secularization of Modi as well. Uh, as we say in another reading group of mine, let's hold for the next chapter because he might answer all of these concerns. <laughs> yes, exactly. He might start like, uh, I know you guys are concerned with this and then answer it. No, no, it, it, I think it's a, it's a fantastic work. I just think it's important to keep some of these things that are popping up in my mind in mind course, for me course, as, as I'm reading this to see, because I do, I do see, um, I, I do wonder if there isn't a, a sort of like residual liberalism because of his reliance on Kantian ethics. And if that's the case, that doesn't necessarily mean it's discredited. It's just in what ways might it fall into certain notions of just like pure French fetishistic of negative liberty or something like that. Um, and I do work on Sartre, so I'm like swimming in that world, right? Um, and then at the same time, you know, there, there's just other things like, I think his, his reading of Christianity is actually just wrong. Um, but that's just something we can kind of debate at, at a really fundamentally alter his argument. But I think there are some misreadings here that he, he fundamentally assumes based on some old readings of the relationship between Christianity and Judaism and, um, that have been answered, I think, by a lot of literature on second temple Judaism, for example. Um, so like there's just some fundamental things that I'm kind of curious about here to see how it's going to kind of all wrap up. And I wonder if it isn't kind of fit within this notion of a Kantian schema of the regulative principle, the regulative idea. Yeah, man, like I, I, I just think, again, we really need to adopt, like if you don't adopt the way that he goes about these things, it's impossible to move forward because he doesn't care for the details of anything. Like, you, everything he says is right, wrong right. if you look in the details. <laughs> but in yeah, yeah. other sense, he doesn't care for our little debates on this, this and that. Like Christianity yeah, is not special for him. It's like any, like no. his whole point is, it's just like everything, like world religions, you know, there's a bunch of them. Like, <laughs> so even with Kant, right. he has a very specific take on it that is not about our own, like he doesn't really care if, you know, like his use of regulative ideas, so on, it's very kind of, uh, everything is very kind of at the service of his approach. And I think that this is important because we're, it's so weird that he gets to compress so much stuff into like a work that it's very tempting to peg the guy in like as choosing one of the perspectives we already know, like, aha, he's the Kantian. But I think it's all about how do our references, how are our references read by this crazy guy? And like, what are we to him and not what is he to us? Like, uh, he doesn't really enter into, like, he doesn't really respect this stuff. And uh, that's why I particularly don't think that he's a Kantian because I don't think he, he really, like, he puts Kant with Descartes and Kant is like Marx and like, I think the weird question is from which this, from what distance need to, do you need to be looking at Western canon that these things look so close together, right? And I think that distance is the important thing. That's let's say his own theory. Whereas the thing he's talking about is just let's say an effect of the distance he's taking. So what's left of Kant is actually not that much. Like it's some one, a couple of traces, like, the question about his theory is the question of where is his standing that it makes these things look so eight bit, like so low res. It's not, not so much of is he spousing this or that, because I don't think we can find any particular thinker that is clearly, you know, 
his best partner there. Like all of them look, with the exception of Marx, I think in a certain sense, but even in that case, uh, he's critiquing Marx from the first page all the way to this point, right? Uh, I think it's uh, it's a hard thing to, to, I think it's easy to fall into this sort of kind of uh, spiraling of, of detail and reference that I don't think really fits his very weird uh, kind of strategy. And that strategy is, is the thing that I think really defines what he's doing. And I don't think it's exactly a Kantian strategy. It's a weird thing yeah. I don't know how to talk about. Yeah, no, well, well said. I, um, I will take this time to, I think, draw us to a close. Gabriel, fabulous job, man. We are very grateful for this um, really just tour de force. Oh, this uh, was crazy. Uh, effort. <laughs> It's worth it. It's crazy. It's madness, but it's the only way. Uh, no, next time will be nicer as well. It's it's all about. It's it's our you know it's our hometown. It's modernity. Um, it's exploitation. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, you've left. You've you've elevated it to a level of rigor that has been very refreshing for all of us. It's uh, we we long for in uh, these two hours each Monday to escape from the doldrums of uh, pandemic <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> and just to think you you would live in this world permanently i'm so envious my god um no but great work man and thank you to everybody uh, is there any final comments before we close okay very good great thanks, guys thanks everyone i recorded it this time so it it, it will be up soon this time I, we, we won <laughs> all the best see you guys bye-bye Bye-bye.